Hers is probably the most recognizable voice on CBC Radio, and for 25 years, her conversations with some of the finest writers in the world have captivated and informed Canadian readers. Now, Eleanor Wachtel has collected a precious few of those interviews in a new book, The Best of Writers and Company, Interviews with 15 of the World's Greatest Authors. And Eleanor joins us now to discuss what makes some writers truly remarkable. Welcome. Thank you. I wanted to start where you, you usually start at the beginning, but in this situation, I wanted to start at the beginning of your radio career. Um, what was your first job in radio? Well, it was kind of funny because I, I hadn't had any particular ambitions. I kind of got into radio by accident. I recently moved to Vancouver. Mm -hmm. I was looking for work. I was interested in magazine work, and I'd heard that there was a job on the local morning show. Uh, when I got there, I found out that it actually had been filled. It was a full-time producer job behind the scenes. But if I wanted to contribute uh, to on-air programming, I could do that. But I had to do something that the regular host couldn't do in studio, because why else would they hire a freelance? So it had to be something, I think quirky was probably the word they used. So I went away and I came back with a whole list of ideas and the producer ticked off a few. and I. I, went, I set out with a portable tape recorder, mm -hmm. and uh, the first thing I did was interview a Mexican mime at the Vancouver Art Gallery. For radio? Uh, for radio. <laughs> <laughs> not only did he not speak English, <laughs> you know, he barely spoke, right? Yeah. So, okay, that didn't quite work. So then I, 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 my husband at the time was working at UBC, and I'd heard that there was uh, someone, in, a sociologist, who was studying sign language in sawmills, because apparently the it, sawmills are, I mean, obviously are so noisy that people can't actually speak, so they developed this elaborate sign language, even including telling jokes. But then I realized I really had not grasped the medium of radio, because he was showing <laughs> me sign language. And finally, I, I kind of twigged, and uh, I interviewed a, a woman, Frances Adaskin, who at the age of 72, mm -hmm. uh, after accompanying her husband, Harry, uh, who was a violinist, and she was on, uh, accompanying him on the piano. Mm -hmm. At 72, she made her solo debut, and she was charming and articulate, and I got my little radio clip, and I went on. And, and I did what was called a, a tape talk, where I would introduce the person mm -hmm. um, on the radio and then play a little clip of them uh, speaking or performing, and then would talk some more. And that's how I started off in radio. And uh, that you also had to write the script for the host as well, right? Well, yeah, that, that got even more elaborate <laughs> well, because um, I, after a little while, I became the theater critic for the mm -hmm. morning, that same morning show. And so I would go to a play the night before and, uh, and have to be on the radio the, you know, the next morning. I'd come back from the play. Um, I'd eat something so I would feel awake. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have been like, you know, the 300-pound theater critic if I kept that, <laughs> as I suppose. But anyway, luckily, yeah. luckily it worked. the metabolism worked. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I would, for that, I would I'd have to write the I'd write the intro. Yeah. I'd write the question for the, the 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 regular morning show host, and I'd write my answers because I couldn't rely on the fact that early in the morning I'd be able to think straight. So I, that's how I really learned how to write for radio, which was important. Uh, I'm sure you know from. Mm -hmm. uh, talking on TV, you know, mm -hmm. short sentences that go forward, not too elaborate, and so on. And in your book, you write that sometimes the host was actually, like, reading his paper until his part came up. Yes. So well, that was funny. It was exactly right. <laughs> but I, I could go away. I, I thought I should get Best Actress Award for just my little performances doing these theater reviews, yeah. because, uh, yeah, they had the thing they were doing, and they would just sort of pitch a question at mm -hmm. me, and then as soon as I stopped talking, they'd pitch the next question. <laughs> what were job opportunities like back then in uh, arts reporting? Well, um, in some ways, they probably were good, but mm -hmm. I found that they really weren't that good. And, and particularly, I was in Vancouver, and I don't know if you remember, there was the, well, you probably don't remember, mm -hmm. but there was an old slogan about, uh, in, in the second wave of feminism, biology is destiny. You know, mm -hmm. in other words, if you were a woman, that meant you know, your, your yeah. destiny your was going to be life shaped. Been chosen, your yeah. life has been chosen. Yeah. And I found, we're trying to get work in Vancouver, and particularly for CBC Radio, which mm -hmm. was so based in, and still is so based in, in Toronto, mm -hmm. um, that not biology, but geography was destiny. <laughs> and that was what I was really sort of clamoring to try to get more work. So I would come to Toronto. I ended up freelancing. I, mm -hmm. I worked for radio. I wrote for magazines. I'd come on these work trips to Toronto mm -hmm. for, uh, to meet with editors at Chatelaine, City Woman, uh, Saturday Night Magazine, Financial Post Magazine. And, uh, and then I'd go back to Vancouver and then you know, I'd, I'd write articles for the magazines and I would contribute to radio shows. How did Writers and Company get started? Well, 
Uh, in the fall of 1987, I was invited to Toronto on a one-year contract to work full-time for CBC Radio for an mm -hmm. arts program called State of the Arts. It was a Sunday afternoon omnibus arts show. And I was to be the literary commentator. For some reason, I could only say that in italics <laughs> or <laughs> quotation marks or something, you know. And it meant I would prepare little documentaries or do more of these kind of tape talks. Mm -hmm. And I did that for a couple of years, and at the same time, there was um, something called the Arts Report, uh, which was these very short art, art pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, it was um, a report that was attached uh, to the 8 o'clock news and 9 o'clock news on the stereo network, as it was called now, Radio 2. Mm -hmm. And the report was 1 minute 20 seconds long, including a 40 second clip. So I used to refer to that as the haiku of arts journalism. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> and I was doing that for a while. Yeah. But what I really wanted to do, because the, the, where I was, the, that weekly arts show uh, ended after that first one-year contract, mm -hmm. turned into a, a, a daily arts show, which I also contributed to. But uh, what I, my dream was to do a weekly show that w could spend a, not necessarily a whole hour with a single author as it evolved, but mm -hmm. just to, a weekly show, that rhythm, the pace of a weekly show, rather than the daily kind of, I, I hesitate to say grind, but it just meant you had to do, sort of do quicker hits for a daily show. Mm -hmm. So uh, after a couple of years of uh, contributing to the, to the daily show and to the arts reports, um, the, there was a, a weekly book show that lost its host and they invited me to take it over. And the big challenge for me uh, initially was the name of the show mm -hmm. uh, because they wanted to give it a name that had been attached to an, an earlier show called Speaking Volumes, which I always feel is kind of like a pompous sounding <laughs> show. <laughs> and I have to put on an accent to say it. Yeah. Uh, so I, a friend of mine, who, the show was on at 1 o'clock on, on CBC Stereo, mm -hmm. and a friend of mine said, um, you should call it At One with Eleanor. But I thought that was too Buddhist. So <laughs> that I, it was too namaste. Yeah. yeah. Um, and another friend had a bookstore mm -hmm. in Toronto called Writers and Company. And I asked, would she mind if I borrow the name? It was called Re Writers and Co. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the idea of company because of two ways. In terms of making it very inviting to the audience you, and, and the listener, you, everyone is in, 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 we're all in the same company. Mm -hmm. And also to give me a little bit of latitude so I could interview people like um, theater, uh, playwrights, mm -hmm. uh, film directors, and, and musicians occasionally, you know, just to open up the company. And uh, by having it writers and company, then it would... A little Why bit didn't you use your name and company? It didn't even... It, I, believe me, it didn't occur to me, and it didn't occur to anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the first year was uh, pretty impressive. Uh, you had Mo Mordecai Richler, Rohinton Mystery, Margaret Atwood, and that's just from Canada. What do you remember about that first year? Well, I have to say I was amazed when I went, it's the 25th anniversary mm -hmm. season of Writers and Company uh, this past year, and I have to say I was amazed when I went back to see who was on the show that first season. I hadn't remembered, uh, as you say, just from Canada, mm -hmm. and Alice Munro, and J.M. Coetzee from mm -hmm. South Africa, and Gugi Wafiongo from Kenya, mm -hmm. uh, Derek Walcott from the Caribbean. I, at the time, we were just trying to find the most interesting, best writers we could come across mm -hmm. and uh, and as I said we didn't devote a whole hour to a single author it was uh, more of a magazine style show uh, there was a literary feature there would be sometimes a panel and uh, it wasn't until I interviewed Nadine Gordimer who I'd been an admirer for a very long time mm -hmm. that we made it a special because uh, I mean she was in Johannesburg I was in a studio in Toronto mm -hmm. and it was such an amazing opportunity that we took the whole hour and devoted it to her. And I kept saying, this is so special because we're mm -hmm. devoting an hour to a single author. What do you think you got out of an hour instead of having just a few interviews within the hour? It's quite different. And it's, it's, a, it's a good question mm -hmm. because to, on the face of it, you think, well, you know, so many shows have these shorter interviews and you can find out about the person, find out about their work, and then move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. There's a different level of, of it's both depth and breadth because there's an arc of a conversation when you have that kind of time. You can go into depth about the author's background, but also talk about more than one book. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, and and just cover the span of a career, um, the span of a life. I mean, it's not definitive in that sense. And there are some writers, of course, I've gone back to and talked to uh, on other on further occasions. It's not like I've done them or anything, mm -hmm. but you can get at. Um, a sense of their 
what informs their art? Uh, uh, what fuels their life? Um, the, the intersection between the two? Um, and not even necessarily looking for autobiographical sources for the fiction, although I'm, I'm always interested in that as well. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it's also like turning a page, starting a new paragraph, saying their name, going to another subject, and a different place in, in the conversation. What I found fascinating reading uh, some of the stories in the book, uh, the interviews in the book, is that some of them. Though they are stories. They're stories. I, 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 love that, I love that you say that. I know. Okay, I'm glad. I thought it was like. Because <laughs> for me, yeah. it felt like um, I was eavesdropping, eavesdropping on a conversation. Um, is that you talk about multiple books. I know after 25 years, you probably have interviewed some of them several times. But for, why did you make a conscious effort to read all of their work when you spoke to them? I, I don't always read all their work, mm -hmm. but I certainly try to, and I'll yeah. read the most recent work and then go back and read earlier novels if I can. Mm -hmm. It's to get a sense of, of, of the shape of their career and their, their uh, obsessions, really. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I subscribe to the obsession theory of creativity. I mean, you only write novels. It's so hard. It's so, it's so competitive. It's so difficult. You only do it if you're driven to do it. It's sort of uh, Rilke's advice to the young poet. You know, if you can dig ditches, do that. Mm -hmm only write poetry if you absolutely must. And so I, I think there's a kind of passion that these writers have, and uh, or obsession, depending how you, you want to uh, emphasize it. And so by going back to earlier work, you see where, they've, where they're coming from, where they, how, they've evolved, how their work has evolved, how their interests have evolved, and, um, and what's, what's given it shape. I wanted to follow up on that, but we're running out of time already. I have so many questions for you. Um, I wanted to move on and talk about some of the writers that you have in the book. We'll start with Jonathan Franzen and a little biography information on him. He was born in 1959, Western, Spring, Western Springs, Illinois, author of five novels, including The Corrections, Freedom and Purity, National Book, book Award in Fiction for The Corrections, first living novelist to appear on the cover of Time magazine in a decade. Why was that significant? The Time magazine? Yes. Thing? Well, it's, it was significant in the sense that he had, it wasn't like he was an overnight success. He had mm -hmm. been sort of slogging in the trenches for a long time. And he had written, in fact, a, a controversial piece that had appeared in um, Harper's or the Atlantic, one of those, mm -hmm. um, because he'd been writing, trying to write, and had been writing and publishing big novels, ambitious novels, that had had only moderate success. And he just felt that the world wasn't ready for him or what, had moved to a different place. And he uh, was alienated from that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then he wrote this book called The Corrections that just took off and made him a celebrity and, and sold millions of you know, everything. Um, when he was on the cover of Time Magazine, it was with his second what I refer to as blockbuster novels. Mm -hmm. They are large, uh, as well as being ambitious and big. Mm -hmm. And that was freedom. And um, being on the cover, he, he, had, he had somehow become a celebrity by having that work, but it also being a very serious, committed writer. Mm -hmm. And in fact, with the corrections, he'd also, there was also controversy because he'd been invited to be on Oprah's show. And everybody you know, who's invited on Oprah is like thrilled because they sell you know, a ton of copies, but he was so, he took himself so seriously and that he, want to sell he wasn't sure that somehow that having that sticker on his book was too commercial. Mm -hmm. And then there was a, a back and a forth thing about it. And they, they made up and everything, and that mm -hmm. was okay. But um, for someone who had such widespread uh, popularity at the same time with very serious ambitions, I think it was significant that he was on the cover of Time magazine. And you interviewed him in his home uh, in Santa Cruz, California. How forthcoming was he with you? He's surprisingly forthcoming. Uh, part of it, I think, has to do with the fact that the family is at the center of his work. Uh, he sees the fam of, his, of, the, of these blockbuster novels, uh, he sees the family as a kind of explosive force mm -hmm. and something that's a, a, rich, a rich source of fiction and imagination. And he's drawn on his own family in different ways, mm -hmm. in different forms, and, and in his own first marriage. And so I don't know if it's. Be in, in a sense, that gives me a little bit of license to ask about his family. Mm -hmm. But the, what gave me greater license, because I, I don't, I mean, even though I'm obviously, like any of us, you know, interested in, in, in how people live and their relationships with their family and all that kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, I don't tread there unless there is some access point. And with Franzen, he had written a memoir called mm -hmm. The Discomfort Zone. And 
there he opens up quite a lot about his relationship, particularly with his mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's very candid about it and about how he came around to appreciating her, but almost only when she was dying. And as he says, and it's quite poignant, he says, now I have the rest of my life to try to deal with that. And moments like that are, I mean, I have slight shivers even saying mm -hmm. it, you know, because moments like that, they're so, they're so touching and they're something that anyone can connect we to. We can all relate to that. Yeah. We don't uh, have to be a big famous writer, you mm -hmm. know. We can feel that or pain even have, Or even have read the books, but mm -hmm. we, we, we understand that. How does it change the conversation or, or the interview when you go to their homes as opposed to doing it in the studio? Well, it's, it's extra, it's more fun for me. <laughs> uh, and I get to take photographs and, and see them in a context. Um, in terms of the actual content of the interview, I'm not sure it's that different um, mm -hmm. because in the studio, and a lot of my interviews aren't even in the studio, they're, they're over the phone and I'm in one studio and the person is thousands of miles away mm -hmm. in another studio, so it's not even face to face. But I try to establish, a, a, um, not, I mean, it would be presumptuous to say intimacy, but just a direct connection and focus. And, and uh, Franzen and even some other people I've interviewed said they sometimes, they don't even mind being not face to face, being in a studio with headphones on, their eyes closed, and it's kind of like they're in the, the in, zone. In, in a zone. Right. Yeah. And um, you're talking right into their ear. <laughs> I want to move on to Alice Munro, mm -hmm. um, someone that we. we well, I love, a yes. lot of people love. Yes, Every, um, <laughs> everyone loves, believe me. <laughs> um, she was born in 1931 in Wingham, Ontario, author of 16 published works, including Runaway, Too Much Happiness, and Dear Life, Nobel Prize in Literature, and described as Canada's Chekhov, according to writer Cynthia Ozick. Um, how well earned is that moniker, Canada's Chekhov? Oh, I think definitely. Mm -hmm. um, she, she's, she's one of our greatest writers, mm -hmm. and, and because I have my program and has such an international focus, I, I get to meet a lot of writers from around the world, mm -hmm. and to a man and to a woman, they admire Alice Munro. Mm -hmm. Why do you think? Oh, I'd almost say you just, just you know, read her. Yeah. <laughs> I was recently asked about, you know, sort of desert island books, like what you would take to mm -hmm. a desert island. And, I, and when I tried to dodge it by saying I'd take a Kindle, but it doesn't work. <laughs> you run out of power. Can't you? Yeah. Run out of power, can't <laughs> uh, I actually thought, you know, the, 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 the collected Alice Munro, because when you finish it, you could just go back and start over again. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they are so rich and nuanced and honest mm -hmm. and, uh, and complex. And, she, and her work has changed over the years, too. So you could start at the beginning and move to more recent work and then go back. And there's, there's some books in the middle that are, you know, a single short story is like three-dimensional chess that has such complexity. She's reluctant to do interviews. How did you get one with her? Well, I actually got two with her. Yeah. <laughs> and the first one was the first season of yeah. Writers and Company. And that was through a mutual friend. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just off the cuff. She had, she had come with me uh, to hear uh, Audrey Thomas mm -hmm. do a reading. And uh, we were both in the audience. And I said, you know, I'd, I just started this book show. I'd love to talk to you. And she said, mm -hmm. OK, tomorrow, which I was thrown into a paddock. Mm -hmm. uh, the more recent interview, and the one that's in this, in this book, mm -hmm. uh, was as, because she was a, a finalist for a Giller Prize for her book, Runaway. And it was her, no, she was nominated for, it was the second time she was nominated and the second win mm -hmm. for the Giller Prize. And that we, uh, we did in this, in, near her hometown of Wingham, Ontario. There's a, in Goderich, uh, there's a cafe um, that I wanted to call Alice's Restaurant, but it's mm -hmm. not. <laughs> <That> fantastic conversation, <laughs> you know, especially that what she said about D.H. Lawrence, I thought. Yes, yeah. well, she was very forthcoming about her, uh, Femi nascent feminism uh, mm -hmm. when, when she was growing up and the the assumptions about uh, female sexuality and uh, and we all read Lawrence and he was like the guy the go-to guy for mm -hmm. uh, sexuality but it was men's sexuality that he was uh, describing about, yeah. yeah I want to move on to J.M. Cortiza um, and he's born in 1940 Cape Town South Africa author of dozens of published works including Age of Iron Disgrace and the Childhood of Jesus Nobel Prize in Literature and Animal Rights Activist. He gave you some conditions before interviewing him. Nothing on politics, and his own work, 
and personal life. So <laughs> what did you end up talking about? Yeah, I have to put this a little bit in context. <laughs> um, much more than Alice Monroe, J.M. Yeah. Kotsia does not like to, to give interviews. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, this was in, in the year 2000, he had won his second Man Booker Prize for his novel called Disgrace, which was uh, uh, a, a very powerful, unflinching novel uh, set in South Africa. And I was going to South Africa to do a special series, and I was interviewing a lot of new and younger and different and diverse writers, mm -hmm. but still, I had I felt I had to talk to him. I wanted to talk to him because that book was so powerful. Mm -hmm. So uh, we had tried to arrange an interview, and uh, he, he didn't even bother going to London to give interviews when he won the Booker. Uh, he wasn't giving interviews, period. But I had interviewed him earlier when, in that, that first season um, when he was in Toronto, and he, luckily for me, had a positive recollection of it. So he was willing to consider it, mm -hmm. but only with, with those conditions. <laughs> and I just couldn't think how I would get around this. And, uh, it, and, but he would, he would read from Disgrace, and he's a beautiful reader of his work. Mm -hmm. And I had seen a book that he had written of criticism about Dostoevsky and Beckett and some other writers that he liked. Mm -hmm. So I used that as my access route. I said, if I talk about them and people you write, and a little bit about language, and I sort of snuck in, because he'd written some memoirs mm -hmm. and uh, about growing up in this mixed uh, Afrikaans, English-speaking household, mm -hmm. I could talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he agreed. And in fact, there were, he was more revealing in a sense than he thought, or it, even when he would say things like, you know, Beckett and Dostoevsky, they, they're, people think they're very serious, but they really have quite a sense of humor. He was talking about himself in a certain way, you know, and, and about what he was revealing or not revealing. Mm -hmm. And he was kind enough uh, to allow me to, re, you know, do, ask some follow-up questions, and, and that was at his office in, 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 uh, in uh, Cape Town. I wanted to talk to you about Toni Morrison, and Toni Morrison, born in 1931, Lorraine, Ohio, author of 11 books, including The Bluest Eye, Jazz, and God Help the Child, Pulitzer Prize for Fiction for Beloved, in 1993, she became the first African-American woman to win the Nobel Prize in Literature. And you've interviewed quite a few Nobel Prize winners. What is it about Morrison's writing style that appeals to you? Oh, it's, it's musicality. Mm. And, and just her voice, she has this rich voice, and it's, uh, it's sensuous. Mm -hmm. And it might be because, um, I don't know if it was the first, I don't think it was the first time I interviewed her, but one of the times I interviewed was she'd, she'd published a book called Jazz, mm -hmm. and, the, and it just infused the writing. And, and she's also, she was very, I, I, I mean, the best thing about the job are the surprises when people tell you things you hadn't heard about or hadn't read anywhere, didn't know. Mm -hmm. And she talked about how growing up in Lorraine, mm -hmm. Ohio, not far from Cleveland, uh, working class, uh, blue collar kind of town, that um, her father hated whites, and her mother judged everybody on the basis of who they were. Mm -hmm. And it was such a stark difference. And I said, well, yeah, growing up in that world, uh, how did you respond to it? And she said, to her, it was just, like, everything's normal to a child. So she just thought, well, he's a man, and she's a woman. And, Anything different. And, they're different. <laughs> <laughs> and he's quiet, and she talks a lot. And so they have <laughs> this very, but it's something that I think really for, shaped her. I mean, it was so uh, distinctive. Um, finally, I wanted to talk to you about Zadie Smith, and Zadie, born in 1975 in London, England, author of five novels including White Teeth, On Beauty, and N.W., Orange Prize in Fiction for On Beauty, Father is English, Mother is Jamaican. Uh, what insights about writing did she share with you? Insights about writing? Well, she's, she's just one of my favorite people. <laughs> and I, I love her fiction, her nonfiction. She's very forthcoming, um, and I, I think she's kind of brilliant. I'm interested in anything she has to say about anything. Uh, in terms of writing, what she, one of the things she said, uh, again, surprising, mm -hmm. was she could live without writing, but she couldn't live without reading. That reading was the most important thing to her. Mm -hmm. That that's what she had to do every day. If she wrote every day, that would be good, and she would try it and so on. But it was mm -hmm. reading that she had to do. And I remember one of the one of the times I spoke to her, uh, she had just given birth to her first child mm -hmm. and was breastfeeding, and her husband was saying, um, 
you know, talk to the baby because she, she all she was she was she was reading the whole time, mm -hmm. and she said that when she every time she turned a page, <laughs> the baby would, say, <laughs> would jump, and her husband would say, "Talk to her, talk to her." She's that's the child's to, have to read <laughs> the child's earliest memory. One of the questions I would ask people often: yeah. What's your earliest memory? This child's earliest memory was going to be the sound of the page turning. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've interviewed so many people, um, so many great authors. I'm wondering um, who has taught you the most about yourself. Oh, oh, that's so hard. <laughs> uh, one of the people who I, I uh, feel very uh, attached to, very fond of, is uh, Oliver Sacks, the late Oliver Sacks, who died recently. And I don't know that he taught me about myself, but one of the things he taught me was not to presume, not to judge. That uh, in terms of the people that he deals with, and, uh, and he's so uh, he's a humanist neurologist mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, he wrote a book called An Anthropologist on Mars, and it was a series of kind of case studies of different people and, and how they, how he, the, the effects of their apparent mental, uh, physiological uh, problems, mm -hmm. and then what happens to them when, in, in, how they negotiate their lives. Mm -hmm. And somebody like a, a, a man with Tourette syndrome who's mm -hmm. a surgeon, mm -hmm. I mean, it's impossible to even contemplate that. Mm -hmm. uh, a blind master who suddenly got his sight. And in all the movies in Hollywood and everywhere, we would think, wow, that's his, you know, his life's transformed. Everything's mm -hmm. wonderful now. But in fact, it, it was very, very hard for him to adjust. It, it, his life, he, it was, he lost a lot mm -hmm. as well as gaining things. So just like being so open mm -hmm. to, to, to difference and to change and to transformation, um, I, don't know, I don't know, I hope it taught me a lot, but it's, it's someone who I, I do feel a, 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 a kindred a kin, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, what a pleasure I mean, for me. I, this is going to take me, even from the conversations of stories themselves, they also have stories and it's like a, you know, a domino effect. Yeah. It's been such a pleasure talking oh, to you. Oh, pleasure for me. Thank and you I'm so much. I'm still starstruck. <laughs> Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.